Number 50, Legend of Legaia. Three main characters join up together in this turn-based RPG with very unique combat. In order to fight, but also to create different combos and learn new abilities, you have to try out combinations mainly with the D-pad. By using the skills you already learned, you improve them over time, but as I said, come up with new moves. It's a great battle system, but it can be pretty hard sometimes. I like its folkloric feel and ancient world vibes, soundtrack is pretty atmospheric too. I don't think it aged that well, but it's still an unforgettable classic from this era. Number 49, Cardia, The Word of Fate. Developed by Atlus, this is a grid-based tactical RPG with two main characters. Both have their own missions, story and party members, so it's definitely worth beating with both. You have regular attacks, but both magic and summoning comes straight from the use of cards. Cards that you spend a turn on to cast a spell or call forth a monster to aid you in battle. This game has excellent storytelling, great character development, and solid combat that still holds up today. Number 48, Final Fantasy VIII. From one of the most beloved JRPGs on the PS1 to one of the most hated over time. However, no one can take away its early popularity, its magnificent soundtrack, and its memorable cast of characters. Final Fantasy VIII is still very worth playing, if at least to decide on your own if it deserves the hate or not. Number 47, Jade Cocoon. This quite obscure gem follows Levant in a quest to raise monsters in a world full of secret lore. Actually, it kinda reminds me of Legend of Legaia, with a similar style based on hidden villages, ancient tribes and customs. In turn-based battles you can control Levon to fight regularly, but also to summon the creatures he has raised and trained, all in a battle system affected by elemental strengths and weaknesses. Definitely an overlooked jewel on the PlayStation. Number 46, Saiyuki, Journey West. Based on the events of classic Chinese novel Journey to the West, it follows either a male or female monk meeting the deity Goku to journey together. With the exception of the monk, all characters can transform into powerful monsters for a few turns, but there can only be one transformed at a time. It's a solid game, somewhat grindy, but still quite enjoyable and charming. Number 45, Vagrant Story. From the genius mind of Yasumi Matsuno, here comes a game within the Evilis universe. It's quite a unique take in the action RPG genre. You control only Ashley, going solo in different dungeons and ruins. To fight, though, you have to rely on a grid for skills and magic, but also on one that lets you target enemy body parts. Not knowing which ones to attack or exploit often leads to frustrating game overs. It is a very challenging game, one I think could greatly benefit from a modern remake or remaster. Number 44, Digimon World. Not a fan of Digimon here, and as far as I'm concerned, this one didn't get the best reviews back then. Eh, it was alright. Fun for one of the first Digimon video games ever. But I had to include it here because of its legacy. Mixed reviews or not, the game went on to spawn several sequels and spin-offs that are still going to this day. Number 43, Breath of Fire 3. Following the success of the Super Nintendo titles, Capcom also took its own RPG series to the PlayStation, just like Squaresoft. This third entry was critically acclaimed, mostly for its beautiful pixel art and its interesting character progression, seeing the main characters go from kids to adults. This is an excellent game, one of the best on the PS1. Number 42, Final Fantasy Origins. This late release on the console compiles the very first two Final Fantasy games ever made in the form of remakes. Story was expanded, gameplay was rebalanced, and the interface changed entirely. I don't know about you, but back then I thought they were the best versions to play of those games. Number 41, Ark the Lab. Separately, this game and its sequels never came out of Japan, not until working designs put them all together in this legendary release. 
This first entry follows Ark in a quest to find his father while journeying with other characters. As a strategy RPG, it has a lot of personality, especially thanks to its unique soundtrack. It may not be anything special combat-wise nowadays, but back then it was influential and innovative on the same level of Fire Emblem and Shining Force. Definitely a must-play JRPG on the system. Number 40. Sino Gears. A dark philosophical and psychological story that took part in the revolutionary style this era was known for, Sino Gears made a great contribution to darker and deeper narratives, but also brought a dual battle system with both humans and mechs in different turn-based mechanics, a true masterpiece of its time. Number 39. Brigandine, The Legend of Forcina. Influenced by the classic Master of Monsters, Brigandine lets you choose between six different protagonists. The goal is to defeat the others in a quest to unify the continent under one banner. It's a complex game with micromanagement involved since you have to take care of creating monsters with mana you gain from your campaign. These monsters aid your commanders in battle, traversing through hexagonal grids to fight their enemies. You know, this game may be rare and obscure, but if you can find a way to play it, you will at least experience its uniqueness. Number 38. Final Fantasy Tactics A much more popular strategy RPG is the one that made the genre more successful back then. It was thanks to its influence that more companies started either developing their own titles or bringing them outside of Japan. Like it or not, no one can deny the impact this little spin-off had on the role-playing market. Number 37. Brave Fencer Musashi This action RPG used to be somewhat popular back in the day. Eventually, people forgot about it and only remember it when mentioned. It was an attempt at creating a new series, even getting a sequel on PS2, but it just never kicked off for some reason. Perhaps the title and the type of game never appealed to gamers at the time? It's a fun one, with not-so-dated controls, with an interesting day and night cycle. Give it a try if you can. Number 36. The Legend of Dragoon Sony's classic attempt to compete in the market with a brand new IP that went nowhere. Fortunately, this turn-based RPG was a success, especially and ironically outside of Japan. Full of badass Dragoon transformations and several cinematics with cheesy English dub. <laughs> this is a great game. Number 35. Azure Dreams this is the first one in a series most people aren't familiar with. There are a bunch of roguelike RPGs and Azure Dreams also includes a monster collecting feature. By roguelike, I mean one of those where you explore randomly generated areas in a turn-based movement. You know, you move, the enemy moves, you attack, the enemy attacks, etc. And of course, every time you enter the tower, you go back to level 1. It also has some dating sim elements. It's a fun one, and it doesn't get mentioned often at all. Number 34, Tales of Destiny. Despite being the second game in the Tales series, this was the first one localized outside of Japan. I believe it's a good classic that didn't age well. There's a much better version of it on the PS2, but that one never came out of Japan. So, it was a solid action RPG for its time, but honestly, it's among my least favorites in the series. I do love the characters though. Number 33, Wild Arms. The start of yet another big IP by Sony but developed by Media Vision. This one greatly succeeded for many years until its demise on the PSP. A revival was attempted with a gacha game, but you probably already know what happened. This is a true classic and an influential RPG. Did you know it was supposed to be a Super Nintendo RPG? Number 32, Grandia. Grandia was also the start of a new series that enjoyed some success for a few years. With a few sequels and spin-offs, not too many people know this BS1 version is actually a port of the original Sega Saturn release exclusive to Japan. It's quite a charming tale, full of the spirit of adventure and a very original combat played in turns. Number 31, Final Fantasy VII. 
This one needs no introduction, it is the poster child of PlayStation 1 JRPGs, the legendary and revolutionary title that helped the genre achieve mainstream success. Number 30. Alondra Alondra is a weird one. Some will dare say it's not really an RPG, but it meets nearly every element in one of the bunch. Rich in storytelling, but more focused on the dreams and nightmares of the villagers you need to save, nerve-wracking puzzles also await you in this cryptic action RPG. But I don't know, there's something about it that keeps me looking back at it as yet another true classic on the PlayStation 1. Number 29, Suikoden. Suikoden was the beginning of my favorite JRPG series of all time. It was a short yet ambitious adventure with terrific ideas. Three different battle mechanics were introduced in a successful revolutionary attempt, but at its core, it's simple but engaging turn-based RPG with six active party members per battle. This is a fantastic game, man. Number 28, Vandal Hearts. This grid-based strategy RPG was controversial for its time. Konami bent the knee to the ESRB for a mature rating merely for including blood splatter and alcohol. Yes, that's how ridiculous the rules were back then, but I don't know, I think the rating gave this game way more appeal and personality, despite the fact that it's a fantastic and overly creative video game I strongly recommend. Number 27, Lunar, The Silver Star Story. Originally released on the Sega CD, this is one of the many remakes the game got out there. In fact, I think this one is the most popular of the bunch, and there's still a lot of people who believe it's a PS1 original. Nevertheless, no matter how well known this game is on any console, it's still a bit of a forgotten RPG, somewhat underrated. Number 26, Dragon Valor. Dragon Valor is an action RPG where you control a bunch of generational characters. Your first guy will get to marry one of the two different girls, so your next character will be their son, and so on for one or two more times, depending on the roots based on your choices. For its time, it was an overlooked game published by Namco, but I honestly have to admit it didn't age very well. Number 25, Chrono Cross. Following the huge success and influence of Chrono Trigger, a spin-off was designed in the form of a text adventure game, what we nowadays call a visual novel. Radical Dreamers was its name, but it stayed in Japan for a long time, exclusive for an add-on called the Satella View, and developer Masato Kato was never satisfied. Some years later, Squaresoft gave him full control to develop a full-fledged RPG based on it, and the outstanding result was Chrono Cross. Number 24, Ark the Lat 2. The direct sequel to the first game, also including in the Working Designs collection, this one follows a new protagonist, a mercenary that slowly starts getting involved in the same war the characters from the first game fought in. Yes, it's very recommended to play these games in order. The first one is quite short, but this one is much longer and better in my opinion. Number 23, Final Fantasy Chronicles. A bundle with Chrono Trigger and Final Fantasy IV, not sure why they didn't instead put Trigger and Cross together, but the divisive fanbase might be a good reason. Oh well, these are merely ports with some small additions to them, but unfortunately higher encounter rates and longer loading times. Ugh, there's still decent releases on the PS1 and I felt they at least needed to be mentioned. Number 22, Valkyrie Profile a dark, mature-oriented story based on the North mythology. I think it's a supreme and undeniable masterpiece, but one that people mostly know for being crazy expensive. This one has gotten ports to the PSP, PS3, PS4 and PS5, most of them being digital only. You have no excuse not to play this iconic game nowadays. Number 21, Saga Frontier 2. 
No, the first one didn't make it, I really don't like it. The sequel though, completely unrelated story-wise, it's a more decent game, still hard as hell and somewhat cryptic, but less nonsensical and easier to get into. It also has three different forms of combat, which makes it more interesting as well. This is a very unique RPG, especially for hardcore players. Number 20, Parasite Eve. Parasite Eve was a successful attempt to mix survival horror with RPG. It included some legendary cinematics gamers still remember clearly nowadays. Despite being a short adventure, no longer than 10 hours, it's still a very fulfilling experience. This is a must play on the system, a great example of how to mix two completely different genres. Number 19, Thousand Arms. An overlooked gem that also includes some dating sim. It's funny because the English dub is pretty bad for most characters. That's alright since the game doesn't take itself very seriously. Gameplay is traditional but the combat is quite unique. You can only control one character as an attacker and two more as support in the back. Being that battles are often one-on-one, -on -one, combat can be slow but surely entertaining. This is a turn-based RPG I hope one day can come back if at least as a digital re-release. Number 18, Persona 2, Eternal Punishment. Back then, we only got this one, and there's supposed to be two games called Persona 2. Anyway, in here, the main character is now silent and kind of amnesiac to the events of Innocent Sin, the other one. You can find a fan translation of it, or you can just jump into the PSP version if you want to. Not indispensable to understand this one, but it helps, though I sadly have to admit they're both kind of outdated. Number 17, Tactics Ogre. This is a port of the Super Famicom release and it's the first time we ever got it outside of Japan. Most people have no clue this is one of the most influential strategy RPGs of all time and the one that carved the path for the legendary Final Fantasy Tactics. It's also quite challenging but with multiple routes and endings. Number 16, Mega Man Legends 2. I only included this second game since I wasn't a big fan of the first one, plus the RPG elements feel stronger here, with more town and NPC interaction, apart from a detailed equipment system, longer storytelling, and mission design that feels more on the action RPG side. I could be wrong though, but it just feels like one to me. It's pretty good too, and it's also one of the first JRPGs I ever played in my life. Number 15, Final Fantasy IX. Ah, my favorite Final Fantasy ever. Truly a story that defines the charm, that combines adult and kid elements masterfully. It takes itself seriously when it needs to. Tons of nostalgia for this one. I'm glad it left an important legacy in the RPG industry. Number 14, Rhapsody, a musical adventure. This game surprised me. I thought it would be a boring, cheesy and girly JRPG for kids, but it turned out to be quite lovely and charming. I love the soundtrack as well, especially the first town theme. Cornette embarks on an adventure to marry the prince, until he gets kidnapped and now she has to save him. Combat looks strategic, but in reality, it's just turn-based with a few characters moving on grids, just like the enemies. It could also be considered as a hybrid in that regard. Whatever the case, this is a surprisingly good and short JRPG on the PlayStation. Number 13, Lunar 2 Eternal Blue. Taking the story in a more daring manner, Lunar 2 also got a remake, released overseas again by Working Designs. Some will go on to say it's a better game than the original, and I'll admit in some areas it is. It just feels more interesting with a plot that was just different as opposed to the first one. In any case, both games are fantastic and their PS1 versions are among the best out there to play. Number 12, Ogre Battle. 
another port, this time of the classic March of the Black Queen on the SNES. I've played both versions and it's hard to decide which one is the best one, as the changes are mostly on the graphics and barely noticeable, it doesn't matter where you play it. Ogre Battle is such an interesting take on the genre, taking strategy RPGs to a unique level. A campaign about liberating towns and conquering evil as you micromanage several different units and creatures to fight in turn-based battles by themselves? I can't think of another game like this during this era. Number 11, Ark the Lath 3. The third and final chapter in the series before it was rebooted with some kind of prequel in the PS2. However, unlike its two predecessors, Ark the Lath 3 falls short with a weaker story and repetitive gameplay. It's one of those quest-driven RPGs. Nonetheless, that doesn't mean it's bad. It's still solid, fun to play, and I can admit at least the combat was slightly more engaging than in the other two. Number 10, Dragon Quest 7. This is it, the game that's allegedly one of the longest JRPGs ever made. I never finished it, but I remember giving up around the 30 hour mark and didn't feel like I was halfway through. It got a remake on the 3DS, which I imagine reduced the length. Dragon Quest 7 is good, it's memorable, with a brilliant and chilling soundtrack by Koichi Sugiyama, but yeah, you might need a lot of patience and time to put up with it. It aged decently. Number 9, Wild Arms 2. For some reason I feel this game has started to get some true love, whereas back in the day it was very divisive. I thought it expanded more on everything the first game did right, now with more characters, deeper story, more development, improved combat and gameplay mechanics. This is how all sequels should be like in my opinion, even if they're not connected in terms of story. Number 8. Final Fantasy Anthology The last compilation of the Super Nintendo games, this time we've got 5 and 6. Actually, it was the first time 5 got a release outside of Japan. So many people only played this version back then. It does have similar issues as Chronicles, the technical issues I mentioned, but they're so worth playing here if for some reason you can't get your hands on the original versions. Number 7, Front Mission 3. This was a weird release, considering we never got the first two games before it. Remakes are already knocking on our doors, the first one already released. Anyway, Front Mission 3 is a banger of difficulty, depending on the route you choose, of course. Remember Vagrant Story? Its combat has a similar concept, as in you need to target enemy body parts to bring them down. That's what makes it so hard. But if you're into strategy RPGs with mechs, this is definitely a must play. Number 6, Legend of Mana. Graphics and music rarely take over the importance of a JRPG. Legend of Mana is one such exception with outstanding features in both. They are truly the highlights of this pseudo open world release, gratifying in such unique ways. With simple hack and slash, co op multiplayer, and many, many different quests, Legend of Mana is yet another must play on the list. Number 5 Star Ocean The Second Story. Some will say it's pointless to play this version now or it's PSP remaster since there's a full remake in HD 2D coming up, but the original PS1 release will always remain as a legendary action RPG, perhaps the absolute best on the system. No matter where you decide to play this challenging game, the fact remains, it's a great adventure in the series. Number 4, Vanguard Bandits. Another one published by Working Designs, but also another one that's stupidly expensive nowadays. Thankfully, there's a digital release of it on PS3 and PS Vita. Not a lot of people have played it though, a grid-based strategy RPG also with mechs, with several rules and penalties that make up for an interesting combat. However, it's not hard to master, but it shines more on its different routes and endings. Uh-huh, it's one of those and it's really, really good. Oh, and also check out the main menu music theme and thank me later. Number 3, Tales of Eternia. Yeah, well, it says Tales of Destiny 2 there, but that's because Namco was dumb back then. Eternia is its real name, alright? 
Beautifully crafted, it aged pretty well and it improved everything from Tales of Destiny. This one I like a lot more because of that. It's like it learned from most of the mistakes seen before and it does feel like a step forward in all of its technicalities. Still a grind fest, but with a charming story and with terrible English voice acting, but that's okay. Number 2, Suikoden 2. Suikoden 2 is a masterpiece and you already know that, so let's move on. No, seriously, what else is there to say about one of the most beloved JRPGs on the system? One that failed miserably because freaking Konami didn't really care for it and barely printed any copies of it. Sure, it's rare as hell, but it's also digital on PS3 and Vita. So, oh, that's right, the upcoming remasters, I see. Well, that might be a good chance for you to jump into the hype train if for whatever crazy ass reason you still haven't played this legend. Number 1, Breath of Fire 4. A mystical journey full of lore and ancient Japanese vibes, I like to think of it as the epitome of the series. It's got an isometric view, which was unusual for a game of its kind. It was interesting back then, though it didn't age very well. It doesn't matter anyway, because Breath of Fire 4 is such a treat that hypnotizes you with its dual storytelling, playing as both the protagonist and the antagonist, something rare in JRPGs before and after it. This is definitely a great JRPG to end the video, just remember the list was in random order. Chrono Cross is still the best JRPG on PS1. I lied, it's Shadow Tower. Shadow freaking tower. <laughs>